Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Boca History 102, Part 2. I am Patricia Farillo. I am the assistant curator here at the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. Um, I've been here for three years, and before that, I was an intern for about a year, so I do know a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is probably one of my favorite subjects, and um, it was one of the first projects I worked on uh, called Pioneer Voices. And if you guys have followed us on Facebook for a while, um, it premiered on Facebook in 2018, 2019. Um, and it basically follows the pioneer period through the eyes of pioneers. So I took a lot of the snippets from the oral histories that I was cataloging at the time and posted them to Facebook. Now, when I say pioneer period, um, it's a little later than what you might think a pioneer period is. Um, our pioneer period is between started about late 1800s and goes to about, I would say, mid 1900s. Now, I just want to show you, this is one of my favorite pictures in the collection. And you'll hear me say this a lot. A lot of this period is my something favorite of mine. And I apologize for that in advance. But this uh, is one of my favorite pictures in the collection. And looking at it, you're probably thinking 1800s, like maybe early 1900s. And it's actually mid 1900s. It's 1945 to 1950. And when I saw this date, I had to like triple check with Sue, who's our curator, just to make sure it was right, because it's so blank. Um, and that'll be a reoccurring theme throughout this is that early Boca Raton isn't what it is today. It's actually, it was for a long time an agricultural community. It was very small. Um, there wasn't much here other than scrubland and a lot of open space and bugs. Now, as I kind of want to put you guys into the time period. Um, we didn't have electricity until 1926. New York first got their elect first got their electrical grid in 1886 between 1886 and 1888. Now that's 10 years before this Boca Raton was platted by records. We did not have our first mail delivery until home mail delivery until 1956 and Boca Raton didn't get a water plant until 1929 and in 1937 we only had two working traffic lights that operated seasonally so that's just to give you an idea of how empty Boca Raton was now I'm going to say again this is one of my first uh, one of my favorite things, and it's Pioneer's first impressions on coming to Florida. Poor Wilma Zimmer, she really stuck with me. I mean, I really felt for her when she came here. She was coming from New York, and that's right here. Same time period. This is Boca Raton Federal Highway. Here's Town Hall. Here is one of two working traffic lights, okay? Now, Wilma came to Boca Raton from New York at the behest of Mrs. Geist. Now, uh, for those of you not really familiar with Clarence Geist, he owned the hotel at the time. Um, so Mrs. Geist asked her to come down and uh, Wilma said, sure, why not, you know? And so she rode into town and she thought she was in the middle of wilderness when she arrived in Boca Raton. She said that she burst into tears when she saw the town and she was inconsolable. Passengers tried to calm her down to no avail. Um, eventually the bus driver made her an offer. He said, look, if you try it out for three days and you still don't like it, I'll take you back to New York free of charge. 
Wilma took him up on his offer and never looked back. She said as soon as she got to there, the barber there said, you have no idea how much you're needed. And from that point on, she felt appreciated and at home in Boca Raton. And again, that's another reoccurring theme you'll see is that people first come here and they're just like, oh, what did I get myself into? But then they stay for the long haul. Okay. My next story is from Archie Carswell. Archie came to Boca Raton during World War II. He actually um, came to work on the base. He was a soldier, um, but he met his wife, Irene, and they, she lived in Pearl City. And so he stayed with her in Pearl City. Um, and I think that's a really cute love story. It's one of my favorites. But he talked about when he was pulling into Boca Raton and the train was just backing up and backing up and backing up. He was looking around thinking he was in the middle of wilderness. He thought he was in the middle of nowhere until he saw the barracks, first saw the barracks. Um, Katie May Dean Tom Thomason, she was dressed, and Alex, the picture on the right will make sense to you in a second. She was driving into town and she saw all of these people mid-summer guys, okay? Boca Raton was not as hot as it is now uh, back then, but it was hot in the summer. People were in long sleeves, long pants, hats, and they were hitting themselves with palm fronds. And she said that was a very curious sight. And I agree with her. I mean, it would have been weird if you didn't know what was going on. When they got out of the car, when her family got out of the car, they realized quickly why they were hitting themselves with palm fronds and why they were all dressed up in long sleeves. It's because of the mosquitoes. The pests were so bad that in our next slide, and I'll get to it, they talk about you just being covered in mosquitoes. The palm fronds acted as kind of like a horsetail um, to keep the bugs off of you. That's why they were hitting themselves. So the picture makes a little more sense. And the picture was actually drawn by this lady right here in our next photo, um, Diane Benedetto, also known as Imogene Alice Gates. It's her first name. And that's her standing next to a giant sea turtle. And Imogene talks about in her interviews, all of the snakes, the mosquitoes. Um, she said the sand flies were particularly bad. Um, and Sue said in previous lectures, and I'll just reiterate, they would soak, they would wipe down their screens to their houses with kerosene to try and keep some of the mosquitoes at bay. She said, Diane Benedetto said, if you walked outside, you would look like a black bear. The mosquitoes would be on you and so thick. Um, she also talked about something called Florida sores. And I kind of I actually had to look that up because I wasn't sure what it is. And it's a skin bacterial infection that, uh, that's very common to children because they're outside running around barefoot. Who knew? Um, so we have, and then we have Henry James and he talks about rattlesnakes. Poor Henry James, he was a Pearl City resident and he was afraid of snakes. I agree with Henry James. I am also afraid of snakes, but his mother was not. She said, he said, if she saw a snake, she would take the closest thing she could get a board, a rake or something and just kill it and be done with it. Florida is a lot like, um, is a lot like Australia. We have a bunch of things that can kill you. So some of the most common snakes we have are Eastern diamondbacks, pygmy rattlesnakes, water moc moccasins, copperheads, and coral snakes. Now, Sue actually, when I was talking to this, she told me that they used to teach you a rhyme that you could tell the difference between a coral snake and a, a king snake, which is its look-alike. And um, um, she said, uh, red touch yellow, kill, killer fellow, red touch Jack, friend of Jack. I mean, red touch black, friend of Jack. So snakes were a thing. 
And that'll bring me to my next topic, pest prevention. Max Huckins, he's one of my favorite pioneers. He could tell a really good story. And he has a great um, story. He came to Boca Raton from the north. He was not familiar with the area. And he, t he bought a store. And he said that the field rats were so bad in the store that it was destroying his inventory. And they, him and his wife had tried everything to get rid of them. Nothing worked. Eventually, he said he, by chance, bought a snake from a teenager for about a dollar. And the teenager promised him that, they would, that the snake would get rid of the rats for good. So he brought the snake back to the store cut a hole in the roof and shoved the snake up through the hole in the roof to the attic where all of the rats were he said after he did that there was like a earthquake snake it felt there was a great shaking it was an earthquake it felt like the whole place was shaking and all of the rats ran out of the store so fast he said he never had a problem with them again and our other story is, um, again, Max. He talks about how he moved into his house and he had these two spiders living there. And his, his native friends, his native Florida friends told him not to kill those spiders because they're non-poisonous and they help destroy and clean your house for, of bugs and ants. Um, so he talks about how he had two permanent borders and which is, I think, a fun way to talk about nat natural pest prevention and something we're trying to get back to today. Well, the pioneers were using that way before we did. Being a kid is also one of my favorite topics. Kids kind of did like their own thing. They had a lot of time and space. Particularly, let's go into Walter Dolphus. He talks about how when he was a kid, they would play jacks outside on Dixie Highway for hours before they even saw one car. You try that today and you get run over one second in one second by a car. Joseph Myrick is another one of my favorite storytellers. Um, in this picture is Robert Myrick, his brother, and Lawrence Gould, he was their teacher. Um, some would say also a child himself. Um, and he was their cohort for a lot of things. But uh, Joseph talks about one of the amusing things him and his brother did was they would, there was this coconut tree that kind of hung out onto um, a canal. Nobody could get the coconuts because it was so far out onto the canal. So him and his brother decided it was a good idea to do go get those coconuts. Um, so they rode their boat under the tree and Joseph climbed up the tree and there was a snake, another snake in the tree. He shook it out of the tree. It fell into the water and tried to get into the boat with his brother, Robert. Robert was going back and forth in the boat, trying to keep the snake out of the boat while Joseph sat up in the tree and laughed at him. They, they were fine. They didn't get bit, but, um, it was a story for them to tell and I'm sure those were the sweetest coconuts they've ever gotten. Now Amos Jackson, he's another one of our Pearl City residents um, and he talks about going fishing and swimming in the El Rio Canal as a kid um, and he talks about Sugar Hill which was part of his play area and it was um, it was a hill basically made of sand and it's called Sugar Hill because the sand looks so much like sugar. It's very fine um, and it's down, it would be located down on Glaze Road where Glaze Road is today. Um, he also talks about one of their courtship rituals and something that they did for entertainment. Um, they would have box parties and it's where these ladies would um, make box lunches and then they would be auctioned off uh, during the charge and the men who bought the boxes would have like a little date with the woman who made the lunch and I thought that was just like a really cute courtship ritual um, and he said it was like a lot of fun and really good way to raise money for the church.
Now he doesn't say what church he's from, but there were two historically black churches in Boca Raton, Ebenezer and Macedonia. And no, I don't know which one's older and nor will I ever say if I ever do. Sorry, okay. So living conditions, uh, Eula Rollerson was one of our like pioneer pioneers. She's one of our first residents. Um, and she recollects that life was very primitive. They had no indoor plumbing. They cooked with kerosene and wood. Uh, water came from a pump in the yard. There was not much beef. They ate mostly chicken, pork, and fish. Fish is a lot is a reoccurring theme in a lot of um, pioneer his histories, um, and I think it's just because it was so readily available. They talk about fish fries all the time. Fish was easy to catch, mostly but blue fish, and they ate that about once a week. Uh, there was no need for kitchen gardens. I remember at this time that they, um, maybe she's talking about is during World War II, um, where they had to have kitchen gardens. There wasn't really a surplus of food. Um, but again, because Boca Raton was primarily an agricultural community, they didn't need to because the men worked out on the fields. They brought the vegetables home so they could have them. Um, she said that they had about 50 chickens, mostly Rhode Island Reds, for eggs and the table. Uncle Bert had a cow and, a fa and my family walked on a path to his house to get fresh milk. The farms were uh, irrigated, no windmills were used, and lard laundry was done in an iron kettle hanging over the fire in the yard. I cannot imagine doing laundry over an iron kettle in the yard. I can barely do laundry now with an electric washer. Now, Flory Mitchell is another one of my favorite pioneers. Um, and if you wanna read more of her recollections, we do actually have a Spanish River paper for her that I'll link in an email when I send out the recording for this. Um, but I picked two of my favorite recollections. Of, and I just wanna quick do like a sidebar where when she talks about her and her husband coming to Boca Raton, they came when there was not a lot of paved roads, okay? So it wasn't an easy trip. And when they arrived, it was the middle of the night. They, it was dark. There was not a lot of places to, there was nowhere for them to go. So they had to sleep in their car. And I can't imagine sleeping in your car in the middle of the woods where you're probably very, very lost and worried. <laughs> okay, so they rented their house for Maureen and Helen Stokes. Um, the furniture was sparse, just the bare necessities, a two burner oil stove, small ice box and pump in the sink, and an oil lamp furnished the kitchen because remember they didn't have electricity. We would, um, they would have to take a bath in a zinc tub with the water heated on the stove. Her husband looked at her and knowing they had left indoor plumbing and all of the modern conveniences asked her, are you sure you want to stay? And she said, wild horses couldn't get me away from here. I had hoped and prayed that we could live in Florida someday and here we were. Now, this is one of my favorite stories by Floyd. She said, our next door neighbor, George Martin, a bachelor from Vermont, George took me under his wing, to, so to speak, and taught me how to do laundry out in the yard with a tub and a rub board, how to boil water in another tub and keep the water boiling under the fire, over the fire. He thought I was very dumb because I didn't know how to do any of these things. Poor Floyd. Okay, so Frank Cambia, he is an original pioneer resident. He, when he lived here, he was a kid um, and he is from Yamato, the Yamato colony. Um, and I'm sure you guys, some of you are just familiar because of Murakami, but Yamato actually stretched into Boca Raton and there's quite a few farmers living in Boca Raton. Frank Cambia and his family was one of those. And he talks about living in the house, um, his uncle's house, it had five bedrooms downstairs and three upstairs. Um, his dad used to get rice in hundred pound bags and the black eyed and black eyed peas were to be planted. Um, 
they really enjoyed that. He would pour ketchup all over it. They had a 500 gallon water tank to supply them with water. Uh, they didn't have city water or anything like that. Then um, we had our own electrical plant. We had a Delco motor to power that. We had about 20 batteries. They were about six inches by 12 inches. And they had an old Model T to pump the water into the tank. They'd start the water about water plant about twice a week and the Delco plant about three times a week. And this is one of my favorite stories because it just shows you how resourceful a lot of pioneers were during this period um, that they were able to build and um, kind of sc scrape a living out of the land basically during a period when most of the U.S. has moved on from um, the pioneer period and onto the industrial revolution. That's why I like to say that Boca Raton um, is a late bloomer. Um, remember, if you like our lectures, please be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on all of our social media platforms to keep yourselves up to date um, with all of our content. Sue Gillis will return next week with a lecture called Selling Boca Raton. And thank you, and I hope you all enjoyed today. Very good.